In 1606, 108 Englishmen set sail for the unknown. They dream of gold and other easy riches in a paradise across the Atlantic. Instead, they come face to face with a new world. As alien as another planet. In four months, more than half are dead. People died like flies, and the paradise can kind of turn to a nightmare. This is the real story of the place where America was born. Hostile Indians. Mysterious diseases. Spanish spies. Hunger so extreme, some even turned to cannibalism. What really happened at Jamestown? What secrets are locked in these bones? How did a fragile outpost of Englishmen survive to plant the seed for a nation and change the face of the world? The early 17th century. The New World is mostly an unexplored wilderness, and Europe is drunk on dreams of gold. The reigning superpower is Spain, whose conquests in Mexico and South America have reaped astonishing riches. The Spanish had been hauling gold back from the New World for over a century, and uh, the crown there was just filthy rich. Much of coastal South America is firmly under Spanish control, but many believe there's more gold waiting up north in the uncharted realm of the New World. England wants a piece of the action, and English investors take a daring gamble. They form a corporation called the Virginia Company. Its goal, find gold and a safe passage to the Orient through the vast wilderness known as Virginia. December, 1606. Three ships set sail from London. It's a treasure hunt that will go horribly wrong. And almost immediately, there's trouble. Windless seas turn a three-month journey into four. Crammed into the tiny ships are 108 men plus crew. Tempers flare. The men are deeply divided. Half are gentlemen who don't do hard labor. They look down on the commoners, the only ones with practical experience. It's a recipe for disaster. There was a lot of bickering, a lot of, of political rivalry. It seems that uh, big egos naturally uh, flock to this type of activity. The commoner who really gets the gentleman's blood boiling is John Smith, a soldier with attitude. A few weeks into sailing, he's in shackles, accused of mutiny. He starts a journal that will become history's primary source for the Jamestown story. He writes that the gentlemen are not nearly as prepared as he is for the hardships ahead. John Smith is a little bit of a character that's hard to understand for me. And he always comes out the hero in his own movie. Despite their differences, the men have similar expectations of what they'll find in the new world. Their greatest fear is the Spanish fleet. It doesn't faze them that two earlier attempts to plant a colony in Virginia have failed. And that the last one mysteriously disappeared. A lost colony. Their heads are filled with dangerous illusions. They're convinced they'll find treasure to enrich themselves and their investors. The noble savages will feed them in exchange for trinkets. And if the savages get out of hand, their muskets and cannon will scare them off. 
They have complete faith in the superiority of their technology and their culture. But what they don't know will kill them. Spain isn't the only empire in the neighborhood. At least 13,000 Native Americans live near the target landing site. Most are united under a great chief called Powhatan. He's just heard a disturbing prophecy that a nation will rise from the Chesapeake Bay and overcome his empire. He's already massacred a rival tribe to defy the prophecy. And now, a strange tribe of white men is about to invade his realm. For the men nearing the Virginia coast, the nightmare is about to begin. April 1607. The colonists land in the New World in springtime. The wilderness is in full bloom. We could find nothing but fair meadows and tall trees, writes one colonist. It's a relief from the cramped quarters of the ships. At first, they're sure they've found paradise. They settle on a deserted stretch of land along the James River in Virginia. It's a strategic decision, far enough upriver to protect against prowling Spanish ships along the coast. But their fear of the Spaniards is blinding them to another enemy that surrounds them on every side. As spring turns to summer, the heat sets in. The Virginia Company expects them to find gold quickly. But their pans keep coming up empty. And it's tedious, backbreaking work in the searing sun. The humidity is even worse to Englishmen in wool clothes and body armor. Their paradise has become an unhealthy swamp with no fresh water, buzzing with strange insects. But that isn't the worst of it. They've expected the Indians to welcome their arrival. They've left most of their guns and packing cases to present a friendly image. They're counting on the natives to supply them with food. They're in for a rude awakening. Suddenly, one of their most basic beliefs is shaken to the core. The colonists are proud of their advanced weaponry. Their steel armor weighs only 24 pounds, much lighter than full body armor. Their helmets have sharp ridges to repel blows. Their swords are designed with hilts to protect the hand. Their matchlock muskets carry a lit fuse to fire instantly. They're armed to fight the enemy they expected, the Spaniards. But the Indians are unlike any enemy they've ever seen. Their bodies are painted to intimidate. They practice guerrilla warfare, blending into the wilderness. Their bows and arrows are light, portable, and extremely accurate. In the hands of an experienced archer, an arrow is deadly at 40 yards. And an Indian can fire up to 10 arrows. 
the 30 seconds it takes to reload a musket. In the New World, the Indians hold the upper hand. In their first month at Jamestown, Indian arrows pick off several men. The death toll will continue to mount. And for the colonists that first fatal summer, the risks are multiplying. They're thousands of miles from home, utterly alone on the edge of a strange new world. By land, they're completely surrounded by Indians who can attack at any moment. By sea, the Spaniards loom over the horizon. They've only been here three weeks, but already their lives are at stake. They need defense, sturdy walls. They have to build a fort as fast as humanly possible. For Bill Kelso and his team of archeologists, it's taken a decade of digging. But what they've found brings this scary time back to life. Here it is, here it is. The different colors in the earth indicate the rotting wood. What you see there is a mold of the actual posts, which would be 10, 12, 15 feet high. The post holes of the very first walls the colonists struggled to erect. The effort was almost superhuman. The fort was built in only 19 days. It was amazing how much they got done. I figured it was over 600 trees had to be cut down. You had to be pulled in here. They had to dig a trench. Uh, over 1,000 feet long to put the logs in. 400 years later, its imprint is still discernible in the earth. The actual outlines of James Fort itself. It stretched for almost an acre along the riverbank. A triangle anchored by a sturdy bulwark at each corner. The walls rose twice the height of a man, strong and impregnable. They were built to intimidate and inform the Indians that the English were here to stay. The structure itself was designed around the guns to give maximum line of sight. At each bulwark were four or five artillery pieces. Some facing the sea to guard against Spanish attack others trained down the wilderness. The cannon was their ultimate weapon. Its booming sound and flashing fire frightened the Indians. The design is simple, but James Fort represents the best strategic thinking for their desperate circumstances. Inside their new refuge, the colonists must have felt safe for the moment. But their heroic effort came at a terrible cost. Because in the wake of the feverish construction, colonists begin to die. Obviously, there was overexertion. <laughs> These guys are in there, these uh, dark clothing, you know, overdressed armor, and the humidity is unbearable. <clears throat> they couldn't stand, they were sick, they were dying. From just over 100 men, their number drops to less than 50. 50 Englishmen in a sea of 13,000 Indians. The fate of Jamestown Colony hangs by a thread. And the final stroke might not come from an enemy, but from a source no one suspects. Isolated at the edge of a vast new world, the Jamestown colonists face despair. They've only been here five months, and their food supply is almost gone. Daily rations are half a pint of barley boiled in water and half a pint of wheat, both teeming with worms. As one colonist writes, never were Englishmen left in a foreign country in such misery as we were in this newly discovered Virginia. Was it spoiled food that killed so many colonists? 
Their writings only list the symptoms. Swellings, burning fevers. Some might have starved to death or fallen to diseases like dysentery and typhoid. I don't think you can just say that one thing or another brought this chaos at times at Jamestown or put them on the edge of survival. Every way you can think of dying, they found it. Science has uncovered one way of dying that no colonists could have predicted. A major source of their misery was something they turned to for relief. The only water nearby was the James River. It turns out that the worst drought in over 700 years gripped Virginia when the colonists landed. As the summer wore on, the James would have grown increasingly brackish from the salt water of the bay. Historians now believe that the isolated colonists, like castaways on a raft, suffered from salt water poisoning. It's a condition that could explain how Jamestown became hell on Earth. Too much salt enters a colonist's blood. Its natural balance is thrown off. The colonist's brain signals his body to drink more water. If the salt concentration reaches a dangerous level, his body is forced to steal the water from its own cells. It sucks its organs dry, robbing its own life force. The colonist's brain starts to misfire and short circuit. Dehydration sets in. <coughs> Excessive thirst gives way to hallucinations and paranoia. It can be a long, slow, painful death. But there's more. As I understand it, saltwater poisoning can uh, eventually drive a person insane and can actually they can, they can resort to violence. Whatever the cause, the men's minds are under assault, their bodies weak, and threats are everywhere. The colony is on the brink of failure. The Jamestown colony is in crisis. Just six months in, it's surrounded by hostile Indians. Only 50 men are still alive. And they're starving. They huddle in the fort, afraid to venture out. Captain John Smith knows there's only one way to avoid starvation. They must trade with the very enemy that's been tormenting them. The time has come for an all-or-nothing gamble. Smith seems to have had a great deal of talent as a commander of men, as an inspirer of men, uh, as someone who could keep morale under the most arduous conditions. It's a daring risk, but Smith believes careful diplomacy will save his life. He studies the natives' customs and language to improve his bargaining skills. He counts on the magic of musket fire to conceal the colony's weakness. A handful of Englishmen stand against the 13,000 Indians in Powhatan's empire. The Indians can wipe them out with a single stroke. But Smith's gamble pays off. The natives are captivated by the strange glittering objects the Englishmen have to trade. Even the great chief Powhatan is susceptible. It must have been at a moment like this when Smith met the chief's daughter, Pocahontas. John Smith would later write that she saved his life. Legends also link the two romantically. But many historians believe Smith exaggerated the life-saving tale. And they point out that Pocahontas was a little girl of 10 or 12, too young for Smith. But Pocahontas did help the colony survive. She was curious about the English, 
and willing to use her influence with her father. Smith manages to buy enough food to keep the colony alive, for now. But back in Jamestown, food isn't the only problem. The gentlemen still refuse to work. In fear of the other enemy, Spain remains high. One colonist is branded a spy. The guilt of the accused spy has never been proven. But the case suggests how deep the colonists' paranoia has grown. Their number has dwindled to less than 50. Yet they execute an able-bodied man for spying. John Smith has taken over the leadership of the colony, but his position is in jeopardy. For two years, the colony is hung by a thread. It might be dead already, if not for several shiploads of new recruits. But most colonists haven't given up on finding gold. To Smith, the treasure hunt is a bust. Two years in the new world and no gold. He urges the Virginia Company to send more practical settlers. Carpenters. Fishermen. Blacksmiths. But his outspoken nature earns him powerful enemies. The conflict finally resolves itself in an incident that even today is shrouded in mystery. Smith is on one of his travels when he stretches out for a doze. A spark or cinder suddenly lights near his powder bag. Smith's leg is nearly blown off. Was it an accident? Or did someone actually try to murder Captain John Smith? It appears to me that probably somebody helped fire John Smith's powder flask. Actually, there's a story that they tried to shoot him once he got back in camp. There's a lot of jealousy there. The man was succeeding, you know, and the rest were not. He certainly was a marked man. John Smith returned to England in the fall of 1609, but his injury may have saved his life. Another thing that convinces me that John Smith was so important to the colony was that the minute he leaves almost, at least within a month or two, the colony's in big trouble. And this is right before the time that they call the starving time. Of all the threats that faced the colony in its early years, the period known as the starving time in the colony's third year was the most devastating. It's the winter of 1610, two and a half years into the life of the colony. With John Smith gone, the Indians seized the opportunity to wage war on the colonists. They're trapped inside the fort. To go outside meant certain death by the hands of Virginia Indians. To stay inside, uh, pestilence and famine. They were in really bad straits. New recruits have swelled their number to 215, including a few women. But food is scarcer than ever. Severe drought grips Virginia. Archaeologists have found evidence that the starving were driven to eat everything. The colonists talk about having to eat their horses cut them up into dainty squares. And we've got very graphic examples of horses being butchered. You can see the cut marks here along the bone. And of course, hooves and teeth from, from their horses. They tell us they had to eat their cats and they had to eat their dogs. And um, poisonous snakes. And we have found um, bones of poisonous snakes. Lots of them, in fact. The hunger is so extreme that according to some accounts, the colonists even resort to cannibalism. Digging up corpses when everything else was gone. Nothing was spared to maintain life, writes one colonist. 
The graves reveal even more. Bodies buried helter-skelter, sometimes two to a grave. Hands crossed, legs tied, some obviously thrown in hastily without a coffin. In all, archaeologists have found the remains of 72 people in an unmarked burial ground. It appears that even as people were starving to death, a new threat invaded the colony. There is a time when people are laid to rest pretty quickly, some of them in their clothing, which was never done well, traditionally uh, by the English. Probably there was a contagious disease going on, so they're dying of, a, of, of illness, not famine. The colonists' writings mention a supply ship that reached them the previous fall. On board, the scourge that had haunted Europe for centuries, the bubonic plague. This time, the threats facing Jamestown are almost too much to bear. Seven out of 10 die during the starving time. When a supply ship finally arrives in May 1610, it finds only 60 survivors. But again, new recruits arrive to keep the colony alive. And now, after a three-year nightmare, the worst is over. From this point of maximum peril, the Jamestown colony begins to grow. The treasure hunt that began with dreams of gold has stumbled onto something even more valuable, a permanent foothold in a new world. In 1606, Bartholomew Gosnold was 35 years old. He was a gentleman, but also a pirate, who made money raiding Spanish treasure ships. And though he led the colonists to Jamestown, he's known to history more as a footnote. The man who discovered Cape Cod and named Martha's Vineyard after his daughter. Bartholomew Gosnold deserves credit for changing world history. Without him and the Jamestown colony, there might not be a United States of America. It was Gosnold who formed the Virginia Company and planned the voyage in his family home, Otley Hall. Gosnold, who persuaded his friend Captain John Smith to join the expedition and held the hostile factions together. It's a really uh, tragic that he died so early on in the, in the settlement. Otherwise, a lot, of, a lot of the problems would have been averted, I think, had he lived. Bartholomew Gosnold, the founding father Americans have never known. And today, this skeleton speaks of the risk he shouldered in following his dream to America. There was no single reason the Jamestown colony survived. The skills of leaders like Bartholomew Gosnold and John Smith were essential. There certainly was a, a commitment to carrying on under all kinds of situations and, and adverse conditions. And there were bound to be a number of, of heroes that were able to uh, confront all these dangers and all of this famine and disease and things that happened and still uh, pull through. Another hero was Pocahontas, who kept her father, Chief Powhatan, from wiping out the colony. There were many scenarios that might have led to a very different world. If the Indians had refused John Smith's trinkets in exchange for corn, the colony would have starved to death. If Spain had attacked Jamestown to expand its empire, Spanish, not English, might be the dominant language in North America. And if a supply ship had not arrived in the spring after the starving time, the survivors would have perished. John Smith may not have found a route to the Orient, but he did explore and map Chesapeake Bay. And throughout his travels, he recognized the treasures all around him, the virgin land, the timber, the potential of this new world. 
The American dream is born on the banks of the James River, and it's a chance for a better life. The colony did eventually find treasure in the New World, but it wasn't gold. It was a commodity the Indians knew well, tobacco. After all the suffering and starvation, the crop that saved Jamestown was one they couldn't even eat. It was this cash crop that would take Europe by storm and justify more immigration. And from one fort on the shores of Virginia, a nation would rise. <laughs>